Yes, I'm your moderator, James Cantor, and、uh, I am the founder and editor of EU Scream, which is the podcast that fights populist and ultranationalist narratives about Europe. So very, very topical,、uh, and those issues are going to be around for a while. Now, EU Scream is for people who feel that Brussels and Europe are not necessarily、uh, doing what they should be doing, are deeply flawed. But at the same time, those are the same people who feel that we need European integration in order to keep fairness and democracy、uh, intact in Europe as well. So those people are feeling pretty lonely right now, and、uh, they're going to need a community now, and I think especially over the coming years. And they are our audience, and I hope you will be too.、Um, You can also read, as was mentioned very kindly by Adam,、uh, my hot take from March on problems with the EU media in the Atlantic.、Uh, and I'll be, for those of you who are Finnish,、uh, I'll be speaking on the Helsing and Sanomat、uh, podcast with a very good friend of mine there, a senior editor, Pekka Mikkonen,、uh, next week. I think it's running on Monday. So without.、Um, Without further ado, we've got an amazing panel today. I'd like to welcome on stage、uh, the three guests. We have、uh, Daniel,、uh, who I'm going to welcome on stage first. I'm not sure this is the the correct way to do it, but it's a it's kind of a rock star way to do it. So I'm happy with that. Let's have a round of applause. Let's make it as dramatic as possible.、Uh, Uh, Daniel Knapp is the co-founder of data consultancy Acuity, and he's a former advisor to the European Commission on a groundbreaking report in in March that we're going to discuss in a moment.、Uh, we have Mary、uh, Yoller. Please come on stage, Mary. Another round of applause. Mari is the founder and chief executive of Snackable AI, which is a company building a new content discovery engine for audio media. I have a lot to talk to Mari about, as you can imagine, running a podcast. We also have Sven Slazenger from Germany.、Uh, round of applause for Sven. Sven is the managing director of Interlake. Which oversees technology products and digital content for public authorities and for major media companies.、Uh, we'll be doing the Q and A at TransferWise、uh, after our session, so I do hope you'll come down there and join us and grill us on what you want to ask us then. But I'm going to kick off the panel now with Daniel, just to sort of set the scene.、Um, Daniel,、uh, what for you in this report, which I, I read and I highly recommend, actually. Uh, for the European Commission, what what was the challenge that you were laying out, particularly for Europe, that you identified in this report? So let me first say that the report is fairly lengthy. It's a policy report, so let me try to condense it a little bit.、Here. I meant read the executive <laughs>、exactly. uh, summary at the beginning. <laughs>、yes. Yeah, very important distinction. Exactly.、Um, the media are at a pivotal moment in Europe.、Um, the media has has always been the kind of fourth pillar、um, of democracy, and we've taken it for granted. Um, but changes in the economics that underpin media, changes in the infrastructures that power media, increasing the algorithmic infrastructures, and also political changes of who owns media, are all creating a perfect storm that put not only the media ecosystem under pressure, journalists, the monetization, but also fundamentally create a risk for democracy in Europe. So it is that、um, political challenges, technical challenges. And monetization challenges—they all come together right now. And to give you a few examples,、um, nearly every media sector、um, is struggling to refinance.、Um, we're seeing TV ad advertising revenues flat going down. The newspaper sector struggling to have digital ad revenues replace print or circulation revenues. Looking desperately for new subscription-based models. We're seeing public broadcasters realizing that the financing that they get are really not sufficient to build competitive catch-up libraries and recommendation systems that address current consumer expectations, like Netflix and so forth. We're also seeing an explosion of subscription services right now, in particular in the OTT space. But it's very unclear how they can actually refinance themselves. There is a kind of an、um, already a saturation point. 
Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we, it's very interesting in the last panel how we, we heard about the remarkable advances of technology which have brought us subscription overload. So, yeah. I mean, the range of challenges in the media are, are remarkable. Exactly. But of course, at the core of it is that if we don't have a vibrant media, especially in Europe, we don't really have a public sphere for a European Correct. conversation. Now, I'm just going yeah. to move on to Mari, uh, just so we get a chance to introduce everybody on the, uh, on the sofa here. Um, Mari, wh what is the problem that Snackable AI mm -hmm. is really trying to solve uh, for us? And we'll get on to what it's going to solve for democracy a bit later. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we try to not get into politics, but uh, we're not very successful at that either. Uh, so Snackable is building a search and discovery engine for spoken word audio. And our customers are big media organizations who have just vast libraries of audio, but also video content. And as James was referring to this concept of audio media before, I mean, we look at audio as podcasts, radio, audiobooks, but also all the content that has a visual component, but doesn't necessarily have to be looked at. So for example, this conference is generating a lot of really interesting content that you could you know, go back to later on and hopefully search for it, but I would venture to guess you can't today. And you can't do that with most of spoken word audio. And you know, to think about the fact that we've been recording ourselves as humans for 160 years, we have this like, incredible vault of information, but it's basically impossible to search it. Um, it's still very disparate. There's very little metadata. Content formats are very long. So if you listen to podcasts, even if you found something that you think is interesting, you, know, you don't know if they're going to talk about that particular topic that you care about on minute five or minute hour and 15. And that's a lot of time commitment. So what we're doing at Snackable is that we primarily are helping media companies make their content a searchable and secondly, also easier to engage with. And we're doing that, and the only way we can do that at scale is to do that with artificial intelligence. So we built this technology platform that uses AI to analyze or basically extract meaning from audio. So we kind of cut the audio down in this like atomic particle, so to speak, kind of the building blocks. And then we can analyze and find out what are the most important parts of that and sort of serve those parts up to the, to the audiences. So what it, what it, the problems it solves is, A, it makes content as easy to search as text, so you can actually look deep inside of audio and find the things that you really care about. It makes it possible for content providers to also make their content discoverable, both on their own platforms and also off-platform, which primarily means major search engines like Google. So it really improves the SEO. And also, it's easy to share in social media. So you know, it's hard to share an hour-long podcast, but you can easily share like, the most interesting 30-second clip. And then the final piece is kind of like more looking to the future, but not too far into the future. And the one that I'm really excited about is how it actually really transforms things like voice search uh, for the voice first ecosystems like Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant. So imagine you were saying, you know, you were asking, hey, Alexa, what did Elon Musk say about reusable rockets? And instead of this like machine droning voice, you would actually get this fresh excerpts of Elon Musk's interview with this, you know, let's say Inc. magazine when he's talking about launching the next reusable rocket into space. Great, thank you, Mari. Um, it just seems remarkable that there is so much content out there, especially in the audio form, but also the video form. And it's taken us until about now to think about how we're going to make yeah. that searchable on a technology which has changed the world for the past 20 years. I mean, there, there's a lot of questions about searchability and a lot of the content already out there. Sven, I'm going to ask you in a nutshell, having something of a technology background yourself, how AI searchability works. And maybe you can make that simple for us uh, with reference to metadata. I think that might be a good way in. That's a good keyword uh, to, to start with. I mean, the, looking at all the digital content we meanwhile have, uh, we, I mean, we meanwhile have the, the danger that the same thing happens to it that happened to all the old libraries. Yeah? The, how do you full text search books? I mean, now we start scanning them and so on to, to make them searchable. Uh, but the same is true for AV content in a way that Mary just uh, described very well. Uh, the, uh, take, for example, one of our customers, uh, one of the oldest and, and largest film and television archives in Europe, Bertelsmann Ufa. We, we moved all of their, at least the digital part of their archives, 
archive to the cloud a couple of years ago uh, to, to make it searchable, to enhance it with metadata because they had all this content and it was basically worthless because at the time when all of the content was, uh, uh, was ingested in the archive or was digitized, uh, with thousands of hours of content, you cannot, you, you cannot put so many people in there that uh, to watch it and then put metadata into it. You have to, uh, uh, you have to use machine vision, machine understanding, uh, detecting actors, detecting their emotions in the faces, uh, doing um, uh, speech-to-text recognition, uh, starting to translate the text into foreign languages, uh, to create the data that then is searchable, that then is aggregatable, where you can combine different formats, make them available on VOD platforms and, and, and so on. And that is not only true for, for companies like Bertelsmann Ufa, which, by the way, enabled them to become from a pure production company now merge into a content provider, reaching an end audience directly, which was not possible before. They just produced for the old television stations. Uh, and today, uh, what is a media company anyways? They don't have an antenna on their roof anymore and reach somebody who is sitting in front of a television screen on their couch. Um, I mean, all of us are media, little media companies. Yeah, I see mm -hmm. some smartphones taking video right now. You are a media company. A very <laughs> little one, yeah, but everyone else is becoming a media company. We're based at Studio Babelsberg the oldest large-scale film studio in the world. And it today is the German Media Tech Hub. Uh, and it's called that because, meanwhile, uh, the new media companies producing content there and looking at AI uh, solutions and everything else are Lufthansa, our Daimler, our BASF, the large corporates, are producing contents for their 200,000 employees in eight languages and five time zones where they have to communicate. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Sven. Now, let's go back to you, Daniel, because as we know full well, technology... Uh, especially the social platforms, have raised all these questions about how much they're driving disinformation, how much they're driving uh, layoffs from newsrooms, how much they are effectively hollowing out the fourth estate uh, that is journalism, that is holding authority to account. At the same time, what's so interesting about your report is that you are identifying ways that if there's money there, uh, the media industry can recover, especially in Europe where things are rather fragmented to begin with. Have I got that right? Absolutely. And there are uh, two, two components to this. Again, there's the uh, content component and there's the monetization component. And media, and you described it, um, used to run on kind of static infrastructures, you know, um, a cable TV, the satellite, um, the newspaper was physically delivered to the home. Now that we live in digital infrastructures, they're algorithmic infrastructures, which means they are generative, which means um, they modulate the outcomes. So a signal doesn't travel from A to B, but something's happening in the middle for the signal to go from A to B. And it, might, it, it, it might be biased. And this means that, of course, we now have, through the rise of social platforms and their optimization logic, which is about maximizing engagement on the platform, for instance, um, we have injunction points where um, rogue actors can weaponize these algorithms to change the information ecosystem. And the same happens on the monetization side. Think of advertising right now, which is often traded what's called programmatically, which means it's basically going through the digital advertising equivalent of high, of high frequency trading. There again are again rogue actors extracting money away from publishers and also from marketers to aggregate them in the middle, where we have black box systems, algorithms that optimize for their own outcomes and not for media companies. So what has to happen essentially is that media companies have to move again from actually um, pure content suppliers to having control over the technology that they use. They have only, in, in recent years, realized they, moved, they need to move away from one end of the value chain, of the content and the monetization value chain, to, to doing more. A key thing is, just to say that, in Europe, um, there's too much fragmented innovation. Everyone is building kind of point-to-point -point solution and fixing small problems. So what we are saying in the report is there has to be a joint infrastructure. There has to be a joint technical platform where resources can be pooled, that e where everybody ca else can build their own application stack on. And that's a critical thing because media companies have such different interests. There's still so, so much infighting going on that when it goes to b broader alliances, content alliances or ad alliances, often the political will isn't there. But if you have a joint infrastructure in which everyone else can build their applications, you really close the innovation gap that Europe has with other countries and also with platforms and ad, and ad tech. I, th I think you make a great argument for uh, addressing the fragmentation and how technology can be part of that answer. Deep down, Daniel, how do you feel about 
Europe having the solution, about Brussels having the solution. Do you think that's plausible, uh, given your, the work that you've done in the Brussels environment? In the end, it was just a report, but the good news is it was, it, was, it was commissioned, which means there is a curiosity and a systematic desire to understand these things. And that reflects also what I did previously with the commission, many trainings to understand how the content recommendation systems work. So there is a clear desire now on the policy side to learn more. And there's a clear realization that policy and regulation in the future, it needs different skills. It needs skills to understand technical systems and the new biases for information, education, and economy that they introduce. But we're still very far from a solution. I, I think this is fascinating. I mean, how much do we want authorities and the state involved in generating the next generation of media, which may be the things that actually save our democracy? Uh, you know, what, it, what is the balance? Now, Mari, um, for you, w you know, getting to the heart of that question about uh, democracy, media, technology, what what do you think the wider implications are uh, of the kinds of technologies that you're working on? Can they help safeguard the truth? Can they help fight fake news? Yeah. Can they uh, do even more challenging things, like help society get over the stickiness of the lie once it gets out there? We all know that um, you know, by the time uh, a lie has gone three times around the world, the truth is just getting on its trousers. I think that that's the way the, <laughs> the expression goes. So, sorry to throw a lot of things at you there, but there's a lot of stuff to talk to. Yeah, there definitely is, and I think sort of going back to what you were talking about before, um, is that we're just not used to thinking about content other than text as an opportunity for information, education, and entertainment. And I think it's, um, you know, especially with, with audio and video, you have the opportunity to kind of get to the source of truth. And it's an interesting conversation we're having actually in the US, so Snackable is based both in New York and in Tallinn, and we're talking to with some very big media companies in the public sphere in the US now that the 2020 elections, presidential elections are coming, which is, as you can imagine, pretty critical time. And there's a, a, there's a lot of um, actually enthusiasm and, and sort of drive among the public media to kind of unlock the audio-video opportunity because then you can really enable people to go into the sort of the tr source of truth and say, you know, hey, what did Trump really say about gun control yesterday? Or like, you know, what did Bernie Sanders say about, you know, taxing the rich? And you can really go and listen to yourself. You can hear the person speak. And it's, you know, as the media is more and more polarizing, I mean, the right and the left, like everybody's trying to kind of scream and, you know, get your attention. And oftentimes, like kind of the truth and the words that are coming out of the person's mouth are getting kind of twisted three times over before you reach the audiences. And then you add Facebook to that, and then you don't know what to believe. So um, it's kind of a very interesting way to kind of mobilize that sort of um, kind of local reporting to bring that into mass audiences and really give a people a place to go to where they can actually trust the source. Yeah, I mean, it is remarkable uh, when you think about how fast podcast is growing as a medium. We have. Uh, very major companies coming into Europe, coming into the United States, and buying up entire podcasts. Mm -hmm. And we're only just thinking about how to make that technology, uh, mm -hmm. you know, fully searchable, yeah. and how to make it uh, as friendly as possible to efforts to promote the truth uh, against the kind of disinformation that we're seeing uh, from uh, rogue countries and also rogue actors that we have domestically. Mm -hmm. Now, Sven, you, you, you. Uh, you're doing a lot more at those studios uh, beyond the kind of metadata stuff that we were talking about. Let's talk more broadly about just the incredible, exciting things that are going on when it comes to technology and media uh, and what we can be expecting in the next few years. The, well, maybe before we come to holograms yeah. and all of these things, uh, <laughs> let me add on to, to something that, uh, that Daniel just said. Yes, please um, do. In terms of... Um, uh, how can we um, how can we control what's going on there? I mean, it's funny enough. You know, all the digital stuff makes everything much more transparent, which is great. But on the other hand, adding AI to it mm. makes everything much more mysterious. We mm -hmm. don't understand it anymore because we don't know the basis of the decisions. Uh, and uh, then it, it, it's 
wonderful to hear that we have initiatives in Europe uh, um, uh, creating a sensibility for what's going on there. And we need to regulate AI uh, to, to really uh, create a basis on which we can use the advantages without f finding ourselves in a George Orwell novel. <laughs> uh, and, and then looking again at the, uh, at the big companies in the US, Microsoft, Google, Apple, and so on, uh, that create much of uh, uh, these AI algorithms in their clouds. I only see one of them, Microsoft, with Brad Smith um, going up on stage and, uh, and asking the governments of the world to help regulate this at the time where we can still do this. Uh, uh, because one company alone can't do it because then, well, all the others will still continue doing uh, uh, what, they, what they want to. And seeing, I, I think that's, yeah. I think that's so, a really terrific point. And actually, uh, it's certainly true that Brad Smith was calling for regulation a lot earlier than Zuckerberg was. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. So that's what we, what we definitely uh, need to have the positive uses of that. Uh, coming back to your original question, uh, what else is going on there in Babelsberg, where the film started walking over 120 years ago, uh, today we make walkable film. Uh, the, uh, we talked about it yesterday night uh, over, over dinner, uh, about all the new things happening there, uh, and th that's the... Um, the first volumetric studio, which is a studio where you have a huge uh, number of high-resolution cameras, um, and, a, and a, there we have a light rotunda, where we can capture the presence of a human being. So you all know avatars from games and so on, and, and uh, some of you who may be familiar with the 3D VR development know how you can put a human being into a motion capture suit and try to get that motion onto an avatar, and still doesn't look very real. Uh, but by capturing a human being with its presence, with its mimics and, 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 and everything. I mean, when there is a friend of us walking down the street a hundred yards down there and we see him from behind, we can't recognize the face, we still know it's that person because we know how he walks. Uh, so our brain is fine-tuned extremely uh, to, to these little motions and that's what we capture in a very high resolution uh, in its entirety, three-dimensionally, so you can then reuse it in games or so on. We, uh, for other things as well, we captured um, uh, the head of design of the Porsche 911 uh, two years ago already, that together with Microsoft Research, uh, before we had the studio and, and he was now as a hologram standing next to uh, a real Porsche for one year in the Porsche Museum uh, explaining to the audience how the 9-11 uh, design lines evolved over the years. Um, somebody they would never meet, uh, made visible through HoloLens where you can still see the museum and the real Porsche and you can freely move around but that added uh, a human being and you can then start cloning these human beings and that's when it starts to get spooky again. Okay, well I, I think it starts to get spooky even before that to some degree. <laughs> Um, I don't want to be overly negative about it. Um, when we do talk about uh, holograms, when we talk about uh, placing avatars inside of images, we get very quickly uh, into the world or into the discussion about deep fakes, right? And for me, the question is not, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be alarmist about it. For me, the, but it is worth pointing out that there are a lot of people who have already created uh, videos of, say, Barack Obama saying things he didn't say, uh, standing in places he didn't stand. And that's mm -hmm. just the start of it. So uh, for those of you who aren't necessarily uh, up to speed with the discussion about deep fakes, this is the kind of thing that we are going to be expecting as part of our political and uh, advertising diet in the build-up to things like the 2020 elections. Now, I guess my question is, um, how do you build the functionality into the kinds of tech that you're working on that will uh, enable us to counter uh, deep fakes or enable users of media to detect them? And how optimistic are you that that can be done? Um, well, I think all of us, um, uh, I mean, first of all, all of us working with AI sitting here on the sofa and, and all of you uh, using AI, uh, uh, everybody in the digital scene has a, a, a very deep responsibility uh, also towards society and what's going on there. Uh, because we're living in such a fragmented digital world today, uh, I mean, all of us, do, we don't even manage our emails anymore. Yeah? We just get bits and pieces that we manage uh, and, and digest, uh, and we, we don't even have the time anymore to get a context out of these digital fragments, to create meaning. Uh, and, and that's the basis of all of humanity. I mean, getting very philosophical here, yeah, but uh, those are the things that go m much beyond AI, and AI will not be able to replace it because it's Sven, only mathematical algorithms. Sven, was it you who algorithms. said busy is the new stupid? Busy is the new stupid. Yes. 
Yeah, and that, that the, the, the kind of overload factor is yeah. really, really concerning here. Yeah. Maybe we come back to that. Mm -hmm. Mari, sort of the same question. I mm -hmm. mean, how optimistic are you about uh, developers building uh, their systems such that they really are in the service of truth, democracy, yeah. and uh, you know, authenticity? Yeah, I think it depends a little bit also what you're doing. I mean, I kind of like the analogy of cybersecurity here, where you know, if you, if you, you know, care about security and you're building an application that's highly, sort of, sort of needs to be highly secure, banking, you know, anything related to very highly sensitive personal information, then you also you know, go through the exercises like building a red team who is actually going to go and you know, find ways to attack your system. And then you're going to build a blue team who's going to actually figure out how to you know, prevent the red team attacks. And you know, what I'm optimistic about is that activity, and I think it's also driven partially by the public sector, but also some private institutions, is that uh, at least when it comes to audio, which we're very closely involved with, there is a lot of movement. So for example, DARPA, which is the US Department of Defense Innovation Research Arm, has like a foren media forensics uh, program. And there's other initiatives that are you know, really trying to identify the deep fakes. So, I mean, I think with searchability of, of, of media, you know, it also allows us to find the fakes. And I think we need to be a lot better at, you know, keeping lockstep, much like in cybersecurity, where you kind of feel like you're a step behind, but you can't really afford to kind of stop doing it. So you have to get really good at figuring out, like, what is a fake? And you sort of, how do you create one? Like, what's the, what's the next version of it? So today, the way it works with a lot of these forensic approaches is, is that there is actually algorithms trained to listen to um, nonverbal, inaudible clue, uh, clues, uh, which basically, you know, looks for things like sounds that humans physically cannot make. So an algorithm, you know, can create a synthetic speech, but a human being generally, you know, just genuinely cannot, you know, use a physiology to produce a sound like that. So I'm optimistic that we're still there, but I mean, as AI gets better and better and better, I think it's going to be very challenging to keep in lockstep. But sort of bringing everything to the surface with things like search, I think, is powerful because you're in a better place to then find it than kind of weed it out before it does damage. And what I find fascinating a little bit about that is that I, so often uh, when it comes to the way that we interact with social media, we, we, we tend to reproduce the lie by posting something online uh, or reposting it that contains the lie. So we'll put in our little posting, right? Oh, I can't believe so-and-so just lied this way. But what we're doing is we're reposting that. Wouldn't it be great to have more options to be posting <laughs> like truthful snippets? So the more of those that we can make available, mm -hmm. presumably the more we are on the right track towards uh, making our online environments uh, a little bit more truthy. Now, Daniel, there's a lot in that report about what technology can do. You've already alluded to it uh, a little bit. Uh, and what I could pick up on is two things. I mean, number one, you're sort of talking about, you know, algorithms for Europe in a way. Tell me if I've got that wrong. Tell me if I've, you know, if I'm going too far with that. But there was also a lot in the report about real-time translation and about how AI can help that and in turn about how that helps oh. Europeans to talk to each other. Yeah. Um, let me just pick up on, 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 on the point of deep fakes here, because it, um, it connects to uh, the point of real-time translation as well. Um, what we see here, if we deploy technical solutions, is a complete change in how we as people, as consumers, as citizens, make sense of the world. It shifts the responsibility of media literacy into the hands of algorithms. Um, at the same time, we know that rogue actors will always be faster and more creative and, innov and innovative than solutions to police them. And I'm wondering whether it's really a technical problem and more something else. Because deep fakes are not deep fake technology. It's a technology um, that pairs um, pattern recognition, um, um, image detection, speech, and so forth with a certain output. And this, the, the same technology can be used in computer games and in the avatars that, that you were mentioned and so forth. But it's a very small group of people who abuse it. And I think in this age, and the same goes for translation, actually, um, translation can solve many things. But we shouldn't adopt this point of view of digital solutionism, that problems created by technology must and can only be solved by technology. I think that's inherently wrong, because it makes us, as people, it inc incapacitates our ability to act as citizens who are not experts. 
We need to see, rather, what institutions can we trust? Who are the addressees? And target more the people who are behind deepfakes, the logic of it. And the same goes for, to just go to, go to the uh, tr uh, tr translation bit. Um, Real-time translation can be a critical component in fostering a European sphere, bridging languages and so forth. But we should not forget it will not be the solution, because people are embedded in their own cultures and media ecosystems. Um, it will not create a harmonized European sphere. Journalistic relationships, cultural biases will all still be at play. So we shouldn't put too much hope in technology and rather see, use technology more pragmatically. Connect, it for, connect technology to the world we want to live in, to the society we want to create, and the economy that we want to nurture. Okay, that, that's very interesting. Now, part of what the report is calling for, though, is a kind of massive degree of European investment, though, in Absolutely. order to promote Absolutely. this. And if I'm not wrong, what you and your colleague Guillaume Closa were talking about was close to a billion euros. Talk me through how uh, that billion euros might be spent wisely, right? right? Because, you know, for those of us who are thinking about the new technologies of the future, we should be thinking now about maybe how we can tap some of that money, yeah. right? Because that is there to develop new ways of doing yes. things. First, let me clarify that, that sum you mentioned, it's a, it's a statement and it's a metaphorical sum. In, in the same sense as when Apple said, we're going to move into, into, into content production. One billion dollars is always a Hollywood token for, I'm serious. And it's, the same, it's in the same logic that we apply in this sum here. And the, and the background to this is, as I mentioned earlier, there is a lot of innovation going on in media and technology, data science, and, and so forth in Europe. But there's a massive application gap. We are great in Europe at research, but we're very bad at moving from project to platform. And it takes a very different skills, very different capital requirement to do that. Think, for instance, um, about um, how Netflix optimizes content, or how um, Facebook optimizes um, what, uh, um, what content someone sees. We always think of data science as being purely software-based. But there are four critical components that need to come together. There's a number one, AI compute, so a ground-up redefinition of compute, geared at processing um, data cost-effectively, cheaply finding patterns, like the Google TPUs and so forth. Other things we have is, of course, advanced algorithms and large graphs and understanding access to data. The third thing is actually trying to deploy that into a, into a business logic to make decisions. And the fourth is to create an ecosystem all around this. And it's these, and I think Europe hasn't understood that these four things belong together. So what we are saying is, instead of having everyone from, um, from um, um, Estonia to Lisbon, um, from the tip of Sicily to, uh, to the tip of Norway, find their own solutions to do this. It's much too costly. We need to move away from this very, very decentralized, fragmented innovation and really put some money for big moonshot initiatives that can create the foundation for others to build something on. And that ultimately means to treat a media innovation budget um, as integrated in much broader R&D budgets in the space of machine learning, for instance, in the space of how can we build a European cloud infrastructure, and so forth. Fascinating. Now, Mari, um, uh, Daniel mentioned uh, this idea that maybe what uh, we'll need in order to save the media, make it thrive, maybe even create a European public sphere, requires something like uh, a moonshot. It requires something like the government or an authority coming in or authorities coming together, perhaps in the form of Brussels or the EU, kind of guiding the process or maybe even proactively funding the process. Mm -hmm. um, you're working in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> you're from free market Estonia. How does all of that feel to you from where you're positioned as, uh, as, as, as an entrepreneur? Um, I think there's still a little bit of a disconnect. I mean, I think, you know, in, in Europe, compared to the US, the sort of pan-European initiatives with a sort of respective governing bodies, I think it's um, at least a platform where to have that conversation from. I mean, US is just so very kind of market-driven, and I think it's, you know, innovation, wealth, um, kind of opportunities so much created from a private sector. 
I mean, the example I was giving before about how we're having this conversation about the 2020 elections, I mean, some of that conversation involves the public sector also saying, you know, hey, this is something that we need and we know it's a problem. But I think you have um, much less of a, a platform and it's still, I think, very much kind of on the periphery of that conversation. So not quite as advanced. I think it's not quite the same, same amount of um, um, kind of policy making and innovation that's attached to that. I mean, there are sort of pockets around like, you know, DARPA, SRI and some other sort of more, um, you know, adjacent organizations that are doing a lot of important innovation work. But I think the rollout is just not quite at the same level that it has the potential to do in, in Europe or at least elevate the public discourse to that level. Right. So, I mean, one of the other themes that's been running through the last couple of days, and I think it was Evan Burfield who put it very well, I think this is in one of his books, there is this idea that we're leaving behind the age of permissionless innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, city hall and, and government is, is back. Mm -hmm. Again, I'll sort of put the same question to you, uh, Sven. How does, how, how does this idea that in order to save our democracies in order to really reinvigorate our news environment and secure it for the future and our media environment, our free media environment, what is the role of you know, the entrepreneur and what is the role of the state in your view in that? The, well, how do you spend a billion euros wisely in Brussels? Um, the, from <laughs> my Brussels experiences, uh, the, you, you spend a wonderful time in the evenings drinking lots of beer and wine with all the lobbyists. Uh, there seem to be more than politicians. So if we somehow, I don't know, um, get rid of that distraction and enable politicians to get more education on technology, to be able to judge more freely by themselves, like the Chinese are doing. Uh, uh, they're educating their politicians uh, and bringing them into, uh, they're enabling them to make the right decisions. Uh, and so, so that's something that would do Brussels good and probably uh, the taxpayer money as well. Uh, so much for the, for the government perspective. Um, for all the corporates, uh, well, of course we're all market driven in a way. Uh, uh, still, we all, as citizens of the countries we live in, have a responsibility for the societies we live in. Um, and so this, this kind of ethical background is something that we all uh, should and, and, and have to live as well, just like we all have to go and vote yeah, to take care of that democracy survives. Uh, and then when I um, go, uh, look back at uh, how you, Daniel, said, well, Technology will not solve these problems. Uh, the, yes, it, it, uh, it, it never does. Technology is only an enabler for everything we want to do. Uh, and the danger with, uh, with all the AI and everything infringing more and more into the decisions of our everyday life in a respect that AI starts to make more of these decisions of our daily lives in a very mysterious and intransparent way, that endangers our lives as well. Uh, and when I then also again look at the fragmented way that the digital transition is, uh, is, is, is bringing information, uh, news, media, everything into, into our lives, does, also doesn't make the life of politicians easier. They have to target all the niche interests that are, uh, that are arising through all the news bubbles that we create for ourselves. We have as many news bubbles in this room as there are people. Uh, that doesn't make it easier, not for politicians, not for, uh, for anyone uh, in that respect. Um, and uh, let me end that statement with, with one example. Um, we now have AI playing games much better than human beings, playing chess and, and other games. Uh, AI learns that so fast, um, but only to win the game. But when you think about chess, and the chess game, there is much more to it than winning the game. We play chess as human beings on uh, uh, and, and, and many, many more levels uh, that we then take into our lives, into our decision-making process, into our ab ability for judgment and for common sense. I've heard of unethical robots, but it's the first time I've heard of, <laughs> of, of killer or unethical chess players. It's not, yeah. well, it's it, that, but it, it, the AI narrows all the concepts down to what the algorithms are made for. And yeah. in this respect, they're only made to win the game. And they don't take into account all the other, maybe softer levels uh, that also have an influence on us as human beings. I'd like Daniel to come back into that. And uh, I'd also like to come to his support as well, because I, I just want to go a little bit against uh, the question I was asking in the last round. There has been a market failure. We do not see uh, the market delivering uh, enough truthful news to enough people. 
And at least you and Guillaume were trying to address that. Um, have I sort of... Well, ab absolutely, James. Yeah. Um, let me put it clearly. Move fast and break things is dead. And it should have never been applied to the media sector. Um, and it got in, in, inadvertently applied to the media sector by, by Facebook and others. So I wouldn't say big government has to step in now and uh, take reins of the media. Um, but we have to do more responsible innovation. And that is, doesn't mean we, we don't need entrepreneurship. No, we need it more than ever. But we need a different kind of entrepreneurship that is embedded in the cultures and the, and the societies that we live in. I think this is the only, or, or one of the only ways we can really get sustainable innovation. Um, sustainable companies, sustainable entrepreneurships, uh, entrepreneurship, and sustainable societies. Because if we let everything, if, if we let the market roam free, and if we let algorithmic logics roam free, we'll end up very quickly in a dystopia. To give you one example, um, I come from an, from an advertising background. One of my, one of my clients um, recently started a new, ad, new type of ad agency that for the first time, it doesn't market to individuals, it doesn't market to people. It doesn't seek to influence the opinions of people. It seeks to influence directly. It markets to AI. It markets to recommendation algorithms. Mm -hmm. It tries to influence the recommendation systems that act as mediators for people's decisions. That, these are all things that can happen if you let a market logic reign completely freely. So what Guillaume and I were writing wasn't about, um, again, um, big government stepping in, but to providing an, an interface, if you will, between innovation and society. And government and regulation need to play a role in that, but not in a way of putting on the brakes, but rather of shaping and steering the discussion. Fantastically uh, well put, thank you. Um, uh, Mari and Sven, Daniel has mentioned this idea that if we let algorithms roam free, if we uh, don't have any checks on them, we are in the midst of making a media dystopia. Do you, I still ask myself, is this too far-fetched? Is this, you know, dystopic science fiction? Uh, or is there that real danger? And, you know, to what degree can entrepreneurs help check that? I mean, I think it's a real threat and on, on a number of levels. I mean, I think it's one is, is also, you know, how do you, how do you train an algorithm and what, it is it, what is it that you're actually building? And I think there's been quite a bit of conversation about the sort of possible bias of data that you feed to the algorithm to actually make it do what you want it to do and kind of how it sort of, by, by virtue of learning and reinforcing itself, becomes more better and better at doing just that. So, you know, everything from building an algorithm that's, you know, biased against certain kind of demographics or people uh, in general um, to, you know, basically take, teaching it to do a certain job, but maybe not looking at the sort of scope of responsibilities broadly enough or deeply enough. Um, that's one. I think the second piece is, um, you know, how do, we, how do we use technology to kind of, you know, from media perspective, you know, deal with information? I mean, I think Facebook has been a very good example of how, you know, sort of this sort of um, topics get reinforced and reinforced and, you know, sort of keep do going down these rabbit holes until you're very deep and probably also very angry most of the time. And, uh, you know, that's also a dangerous place. And we've seen kind of like the, the repercussions that kind of happen all over the world. So I think this it's, it's not I think it's really comes down to this sort of human machine collaboration and sort of being responsible about what you build and kind of thinking deeply about kind of where do you get the data? How do you train it? You know, sort of what is the job that you're doing with that algorithm? Fantastic. Thank you, Murray. And Sven, again, uh, this question, same question. Uh, are we headed to the kind of dystopia that Daniel described? What's your degree of optimism about? changing course. Uh, I absolutely agree that there is a big danger uh, uh, in, in this respect. Um, going to the role of government and, and, uh, and private enterprises again, the, when do we need the government? We, we need the government, I mean markets usually regulate themselves if you, if you let them, um, but some things uh, can't be, the, in, in some respects, the markets can't regulate themselves, and that's been where we need the government. And that's also why Brad Smith from Microsoft is, is uh, crying out loud for the government to help uh, uh, their corporate environment uh, to get some, some regulatory basis uh, that will, um, well, at least try to, to create a framework within which we can uh, then operate 
Yeah, maybe in a more ethical way. I don't really have a, a, a real solution for it. I mean, you, you notice as I'm struggling to find the right words. So our politicians I have no idea how we. Our solve politicians that. are so wise that yeah. we can trust them to come up with it, right? <laughs> okay. Hopefully. Thank you, uh, Sven. Brilliant, and thank you for being a wonderful panel. We're now at uh, uh, three sixteen, I think, uh, and I shall hand over again. But. I just want to invite the audience for a big round of applause for our amazing panel. <laughs>